Your worship, it is 6.30. There you go. Whenever you want. All right, everybody, let's call to order the regular council meeting here on Monday, March 20th, uh, 6.30 p.m. We are at the W.C. O'Neill Arena Complex in the council chambers, but also we are airing through Zoom and on Facebook. If anyone uh, is on Zoom at the end of the uh, meeting, there'll be an opportunity to raise your hand, to ask questions, and as well, if anyone's on Facebook, uh, the best way you can, if you do have a question, is to email pnopper at townofstandanders.ca, and Mr. Nopper will make sure to put that in the comments so everybody has the correct uh, spelling of that email. So we're going to get right into the recording of attendance. I note that all members of council are here in attendance, no one virtually, so it's great to have everybody. And before we approve the agenda, I do want to recognize that we're in the unceded traditional territory of the Beskotu Mugadi people. Approval of the agenda. Could I have a mover to approve the agenda as circulated? I've got Councillor Neal and seconded by Councillor Harland. Uh, any changes to the agenda this evening? Councillor Gumichel. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, RCS 230308, the uh, Epilepsy Association Purple Day on March 26th is not in the agenda. So I'd like to have that added. Okay. It is under, isn't in the agenda. It's under uh, communications, oh, section sorry. G. Yeah. Um, okay. Any uh, other? Gotcha. Any other changes? Missed it. Okay, seeing none, so I will call the question. All in favor of approving this agenda, please signify by saying aye. Aye. That is everybody. The agenda has been approved. Disclosure of conflict of interest. Anyone this evening? That's nobody. If anything pops up during the evening, please let me know. Uh, so we are going to move right into presentations, and I am uh, very appreciative that we have three presenters for this evening, but I will ask Mr. Knopper just to keep uh, maybe a nine-minute warning just so there's a minute to... Uh, to, uh, I guess, finish up your comments. And it's not that we don't want to hear what you have to say. It's just, it's a full agenda this evening. I kind of blame myself maybe a little bit for being away last uh, meeting, uh, but uh, three presentations plus the agenda before us. We're going to have a hard time tonight, council, to get this done in under two and a half uh, hours, simply the fact that we have closed session items as well. So we're going to uh, be very, very thorough. And I guess on that note, uh, council, please feel free to enter debate, but let's keep it uh, very, very get through the agenda tonight. And uh, again, it will be a challenge based on everything that's before us. Um, so at this point, we're going to uh, welcome Frank Licardi. So he's with the Charlotte County Archives. He's doing a presentation on a staffing request through the community grant application. So uh, council, you did have this before you and we tabled it. I think we we're looking for a little bit more information. So very uh, thankful to have Mr. Cardi before us, who's no stranger to council. So it's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Your Worship, Mayor Akashi, Councillors. Thank you for this oppor opportunity to respond to some of your questions. <clears throat> um, in order to make sure I don't ramble on, I have recorded a narration on a, on a PowerPoint, and I hope you will bear with that. And uh, then I'll be happy to answer questions later on. And so uh, for, thank you. Good evening, Your Worship, Deputy Mayor Akiji, Councillors. Thank you for this opportunity. The mission of the archives is to collect, preserve, and conserve through archival best practices the preeminent pre relating to the evolving history and culture of Charlotte County. And we actively engage the public through research, education, and outreach. As keepers of the documentary heritage of St. Andrews and Charlotte County, we strive to ensure the endurance of the stories and memories linking the past power profit corporation entirely dependent on raising funds to maintain our operations. Our office, archival vault, and research facilities are located in the old Charlotte County Jail, beside the old county courthouse overlooking the large green common. The buildings, both of which are architectural icons, have been promoted as historic attractions by the town and the province for decades. Individuals, families, school groups, and organized bus tours who tour both profits tourist service for the town 
despite it being quite separate from our mandate as the county archives. To do this as effectively as possible, including being open seven days a week in July and August, we aim to hire three summer students. This year, we have requested funding for two from Young Canada Works and one from Canada Summer Jobs. If we receive these grants, as we anticipate we will, they will cover only 67% of the total employment expenses of the YCW students and 81% of the CSJ student. Full details are in your folder. So to pay these students, the archive still has to find almost $5,000 from its own donor contributed funds. By default, it is our professional archives manager, Anna Krentz, who runs the summer tourism program. This position is entirely funded by individual donations we must raise. The time she must spend on applying for funding, seeking, interviewing and appointing applicants, and then training and supervising them on an ongoing basis is substantial. It amounts to around $2,300 in salary costs. Combining the unfunded costs of the students and the CCA funded time of our archivist, we expect to have to draw over $7,000 from our donor contributed funds to support the tourism services outside of our archives mandate. This also represents a lost opportunity cost for the archives. It takes 100 hours of our manager's time away from her core archives work of collections, care, and research assistance. In the town's budget estimates for other properties that the town runs, wages and benefits amount to well over $30,000 per annum at each of the library, the Ross Museum, and the Sheriff Andrews House. So we believe our request for some funds to support us in operating tourism services at the courthouse and the old jail is reasonable. It is true that there is some marginal overlap between our tourism and core responsibilities. Tourism helps draw some attention to the archives as well as the old jail. Tourism students are given basic training by our manager and useful jobs to do when they are not actually giving tours. This can help marginally with the archives program. We also receive voluntary donations from tourists which contribute to the cost of our program. Last year, these amounted to $3,303 from 1,325 visitors. In recent years, we have asked the town for support grants with mixed success, as shown on this table. That is why we have now assessed as accurately as possible the actual costs to us of providing these tourism services. We have provided these services outside of our mandate because we feel they are important for the town and we recognize we are on town property, albeit unceded. In fact, we believe that much more could be done to enhance the appeal of these historic properties. We made a presentation to council in May 2020, pointing out how council could considerably raise the profile and increase the use of the historic common and its buildings. We also proposed the town could save more than $19,000 this year in provincial taxes by creating a historical society. If owned by a historical society, the properties could be eligible for additional sources of grant funding for preservation and promotion. Ownership of the courthouse and the old jail was passed from the province to the town about four years ago, along with a grant for operation and maintenance. The archives lease on the old jail was agreed with the province and transferred automatically to the town as the new landlord. There is just under 10 years remaining on the lease. Under the terms of our lease, our rent is $1 per annum and we do not have to pay for power costs. Three years ago, the CAO asked if we would agree to be billed directly by NB Power and the town would reimburse our costs annually. He stated in his letter that these transfers would not be considered as grants. So for the last two and a half years, we have received transfers from the town to cover these costs. No other funds have been received from the town by the archives. 
However, we do appreciate the capital investments our landlord, the town, has been making in their property, replacing the leaking roof shingles and installing energy efficient windows. We also appreciate the good relations we have been experiencing with town administration and public works. They have been very responsive to any needs that arise and we enjoy a very cordial landlord tenant relationship. They have also allowed us to make such improvements as we can to enhance the experience of tourists. For instance, at our expense, we have produced and installed interpretive panels in the old jail and beside the driveway entrance on the Frederick Street Common, as well as pop-up removable banners in the coffers. So I invite you all to come to visit us and see what an asset we have in our town and how we are preserving local social history. The Archives is a non-profit corporation and it behooves us to manage our affairs in a fully professional and responsible manner. Recently, we have been increasing the pressure on our donors to help us meet our annual running costs of around $80,000. As we do so, however, we must look more closely at where we are spending their money. Our finding that over $7,000 of that is going towards tourism services makes us review whether that is the best use of our individual donors' contributions. Hence, our recent requests to the town to help cover those costs, which we believe bring value to the town. We hope, therefore, that Council will see the merit of our request for $7,248 for this year to cover these costs. And we hope you will agree to approve it. Thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, did you have anything you want to add before I pass to Council? That was, uh, first of all, that was the most professional presentation I think I've ever seen Council. I can't imagine the amount of time you uh, put into that. So thank you very much. The visuals obviously added uh, quite a bit for Council as well that aren't familiar with the operation. He speaks a bit louder than I can. <laughs> he, he sounds very handsome, though. <laughs> also, <bit. laughs> Any uh, questions by any member of Council? Council Harvey. Thank you. That was wonderful. Very informative. I have two questions. Um, just a bit of a light bulb moment, moment for me tonight was that this is a Charlotte County archives. Yes. Um, and I'm just curious as to what the involvement um, is with St. George and St. Stephen. Do those municipalities provide any support to the operation of this archives? Um, St. George has in the past, they used to give us $500, but not the last <clears throat> two years they didn't. And um, no, this is one of our perennial problems, as perhaps you know, being in St. Andrews, is reaching out to the county. And in fact, we're just today planning a, a, uh, an event which we're hoping to invite uh, mayors from the various council, councils to, uh, to come to, to try and reach out to the county. Okay. But uh, that is our mandate as an archives. And of course, this we do entirely for the town, really, although it, St. Andrews attracts people to Charlotte County. Right. Okay. And my second question is, um, why three students? Um, because uh, if we want to open seven days a week in July and August, which we tried to do, we think it's a good idea because a lot of people come at the weekend, then we have to have a rota because we can only employ them for certain hours a week and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's, that's what we try to do. And we, we used to manage to do that, then COVID hit. Last year, we, I can't remember, maybe we had, um, I think we were open seven days a week for one month or so. Thank you. Thank you Councilor Harland. Uh, any other member of council? Councilor Blanchard. Yep, thank you, Worship, and thank you for the presentation. Just uh, a quick question you may or may, not have, have, may or may not have the answer to. With regards to your donations, you sort of talked, alluded to the fact that it's outside of your core mandate to sort of provide the, the the tours and things like that. Just wondering about donations that you receive from that. Does it offset in any way um, the, the the costs it, it to maintain to have those services provided? Yes, I expected that that one would come up. That's a very good question. Uh, yes, um, we do get a certain amount of donations from uh, casual visitors, 
and from tours. And <clears throat> last year we got a total of, um, I think it was about 3,500. And, but if you include the ghost walks, which Felicity Cooper does, and she, that brings in some extra money too, although we don't have to pay her, she just gives us some for that. So that gives us a total of $4,548 last year. And uh, so, but that's hard grind. <laughs> sure, any other question, Councilor Blanchard or any other member of council? A question for staff, I, I think uh, myself, I, I don't want to sit and argue that it's not a worthy investment because the work that the Charlotte County Archives does and the way that you're showcasing the courthouse, the town itself has no plan for that courthouse currently. We hope to get there. There's a motion later today to hopefully help us get there if that goes through. But I think the issue is how much is in the community assistance grant fund? It was in the total. Yeah. No, the total amount in the in the whole fund itself. How much? Seventeen five. So the issue is that it, it was applied through through the community grant assistance program, and when you only have seventeen thousand five hundred dollars and a request is for seven thousand, it doesn't really give the municipality a, a real opportunity to help a number of deserving organizations. You're pretty much allocating, you know, almost half, well over a third, to one organization. So for me, it's I, I think it's the wrong conversation, uh, Council. Over to you, but. If you give you know seven thousand dollars to one organization, you give seven thousand to two, you're going to have to say no to every other organization, including Dial a Ride. I could go through a list of worthy organizations. So, I think it's a not just a really a conversation about the community assistance, but as we look to have this this person come in and give us advice, we need to figure out a whole strategy for it because it is involved. It isn't with the courthouse, but it is. I know as as a counselor, I'll be straight honest and transparent Councilor Gumashel may add on I had no idea we inherited that lease when we were told to take over the courthouse it was not disclosed to me at the time um so I the count to your point and, and you clearly have a lease the town signed up for that um and uh as such when we do a roof repair or windows or whatever that is us as landlords and and we have entered into a long-term lease for the next 10 years for a dollar and we have to upkeep the building and to your point, it feels like when you go for a grant request, you're almost penalized for that because it's like, hey, we put on a new roof. We don't have the extra money to pay for your staffing. And in reality, as you separated out in your video, they're two different things. Um, so council, I, I don't know I, I, any more insight into this. I know we'll have to discuss that yeah, by all means. Um, your point is perfectly valid, obviously. And I noticed one councillor in the previous discussion said this was more of a, a budgetary issue. And in a way it is because you're paying nothing for wages and, and benefits for the courthouse and the jail and you're at the other places you are. And so asking for 7,000 seems not to be totally unreasonable. We perfectly understand if you don't give us something this immediate now or it, we understand the situation. What we're trying to do is set a framework here so that you all understand what, what we're doing and feel we can work towards a, a solution in the future. Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, could I add a footnote? By all means. Slightly beyond this conversation, but when, when I stand on the common and look up the hill at the two buildings there, <clears throat> I can imagine a real center, a visitor center for this town. It's a cultural visit, visitor center. The, the uh, courthouse itself, there are many ways that you could have, use it as a visitor center. And the common is a great place for kids. 
it's two there's a formal playground two blocks away but here's a here's a common you can have informal uh, picnic tables and everything else in the courthouse you have the legion so people learn not to do what's going on in ukraine we could have old movies we could have a beautiful civic center um, displays of all the heritage of St Andrews in one of the rooms, and we could still have the courthouse in the middle. There's, it's not. I don't see it as a surplus. Forgive me, Your Worship. I don't see it as a surplus building. I see it as a centre there, a tremendous potential. If we not too much money and a lot of imagination, I think we could bring that back to be a cultural visitor centre for the town. Yeah, and it wasn't in your presentation, but it was in your letter that if we did partner with an organization, there's an opportunity for the property tax of about $18,000 to be used in order to actually activate the property, right? So, That's right. so point taken on that note. Uh, Mr. Cardi, unless there's any other questions, thank you. Uh, I would say that you're probably under the time crunch. If you want to hire students, you probably want it to start looking yesterday. So oh, we did. I, I'm going to ask council that at the, in, in, through Mr. Knopper that at the next agenda that we put this on there, I'll give council some time to digest this but we really need to make a decision one way or another. Um, the only other thing I could think of is staff, maybe look at if there's any other opportunities or any funds outside of this, because the community assistance grant does not have that much left in it to actually fund this, if I recall from what we awarded. Is that correct, Mr. Knopper, Mr. Spear? So we would have to find an alternative source of, of revenue, but that's on our end, not on yours. So we'll follow up with you very, very quickly. Councilor Hartland. I just think that there's a lost opportunity here for us to potentially support a discussion with the other two municipalities because to support the archives, um, it's the keeper of the Charlotte County history, not the St. Andrews history. That's correct. And I think if anything, perhaps one of the things we, we might be able to do as well is engage in a collaborative discussion with our other two municipalities to say, this is a phenomenal opportunity and a phenomenal resource even some kind of contribution toward the um, management of the of the archiving uh, history is critical. The NBCC is going to give us what they call a banquet lunch opportunity in June, and we're talking about inviting um, at least mayor and their representatives from the other communities to come to it, and we'll expose them to what we're doing. And that's a start. But high on our agenda for this year is reaching out to uh, communities. And uh, also, we need to broaden our donor base because we can't just lean on um, a few individuals in, in St. Andrews. There are limits. And if they see this presentation, they may say, oi. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mr. Cardi. Really appreciate that. And uh, we'll get back to you. I, I would say that it should be an agenda item in the very next meeting. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to move on to the next presentation it is Sunbury Shores. It's on capital project expansion community assistant grant. It does not say of uh, okay, it'll be Mr. McEachern. So welcome. It's great, Dr. McEachern. Alan Walker as well. Perfect. Do you have a video? No, we don't. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks. Um, actually, much of what you just heard um, about the archive could be also said of Sunbury Shores. Um, COVID has been quite um, hard on the organization from 2018 till today, at the end of um, the last fiscal year. We've declined $150,000 in revenue. Um, that's a significant drop from 2018 to today. Um, that has been offset to a large extent by federal funding. Uh, we received $70,000 one year and another $50,000 um, the following year. Without that, I think that the organization would be seriously compromised and we would not have what we have today. Um, I'm somewhat unaware of what we were asking for. I'm not even three months into this, so I'm playing catch up in terms of what we're uh, looking for for grants and funding. If I had my preferences, we would be looking for core funding and probably not through this particular process. Um, we have uh, ongoing core funding issues. A lot of the programming money that we get in grants is flow through. So it comes through our organization and is paid out to instructors and um, every other uh, part of what we do, um, including e exhibits. And what we're looking at in terms of moving forward with exhibitions is CARFAC fees. This is a, um, 
an artistic body that protects and encourages the uh, rights and income of artists is coming into play and it's being mandated, which will require us to pay for exhibits going in the uh, facility. Um, as you know, we don't charge for any of our exhibitions, nor do we think we could. Um, it's, a, it's a regional cultural offering that has been in place for 60 years. I don't see that changing, um, but finding ways to support that is becoming increasingly difficult as expectations of the organizations increase and our ability to fund that has decreased and seems to be continuing to, de continuing to decrease, I think largely through changing demographics and aging out of donors and those sorts of issues, which I think many organizations are facing. Um, the ask that we were putting forward today really had to do with our multimedia studio, which is the most used studio for students. Uh, we have serious congestion problems in that studio, so it's very difficult to manage traffic. We have one um, washroom upstairs that's inadequate at the moment because it goes through the furthest studio at the back of the building, and the students can't access it if activities are happening in that particular room. So we'd like to create a central access for that. We'd like to split the sink counters into two. So we actually have two workstations that allow the <clears throat> students and teaching staff to manage traffic a little bit better. And we don't have adequate storage space in that space at all. So a lot of the equipment is just tumbling out on the floor um, and it's difficult to manage and put back into place. Um, if we move forward, um, Paul, we can go up to um, the floor plan. So here you can see just a very simple floor plan for <clears throat> we plan a new storage area. We plan a new sink and counter area that manages supplies and cleanup and create a new entrance to the library so we don't have to come through the printmaking studio in, in here. The future plan is to turn this uh, space in here, which I've called storage, into a shower facility because if any hazardous materials um, hit you know, one of the students or one of the, the studio workers, we don't have a way of cleaning them up. So we're gonna have to put that in at some point. So that's um, actually built into this plan. Uh, if we flip to the next slide, um, you can go through the budget, which is fairly straightforward. All of this is local um, workmanship. So it's spent in the community. Um, we're looking at spending about $10,000. Seventy five hundred was the ask that we were coming to council with today. Um, it's all fairly straight up, and I've used a fairly um, you know tight budget on what this means. I think um, we squeezed a lot out of it. Um, we're also looking at other sources of funding to completely renovate that whole upstairs if we can, and it looks like we might be on track for that. We'll see how that goes. Um, I think that pretty much wraps up the physics of what we were looking at doing. Um, I'm here to answer questions, as is Carolyn. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, condensed presentation. Council, you do have the budget before you. It's, it is actually well detailed, so thank you for that. Uh, Council, any questions? Seeing none. Okay, so uh, you know when when I look at this, it's the same story as I s said before. It's when you got seventeen thousand five hundred dollars in a budget, and one organization's looking for seventy five hundred, and you've got literally dozens and dozens of applications. It makes it tough to take out of that fund. I think it's a greater conversation with council to say, do you support it? Uh, I know Deputy Mayor Akaji did touch on it. You know, normally you could have these conversations as part of an annual budget process, but. And no one at this table was part of really that this year, on a, at least on a detailed level. Um, so uh, the same thing for you. Uh, I would put it on the exact same docket as the next one, unless any other member of council has a question. I think council needs to, now that they have more information, that's what personally I was looking for is what exactly was it going to go towards. That is all provided here. So unless council has any other questions, I think we put it on the very next meeting and, and make a decision on this as well. Um, Carolyn? Is there time for me to just explain? Uh, the role of Sunbury Shores in the province. Uh, what, uh, how much time are we at though? Is the only, we, we still have time? Yep, we still have time, so by okay, all means. Okay, great. Sunbury Shores is one of nine community cultural centers in the province. Of the nine, there are four um, in small 
small towns, rural communities. Though those include Florenceville, Sussex, Bucktouche, and St. Andrews. All the others are in municipalities. Of the of the nine, Sunbury Shores is the only community cultural center that is not supported annually by their municipality. And the funding from the municipalities um, depends a lot on the size of the community cultural center. We all receive small funding from the province, but this funding is largely augmented in the other three small rural centers, Bucktouche, uh, Sussex, and Florenceville. As Gerald mentioned, in we have a, a growing issue. It is CARFAC, which is the Canadian representation from des artistes canadiens. It's mandated that artist fees are paid for exhibitions. It's basically minimum wage to artists. So for every exhibition that we present at Sunbury Shores, the minimum uh, fee for an artist is $2,000. If we put on 12 exhibitions a year, we're talking close to $20,000. So that comes right off the top of the budget. Um, and this is a national Canadian, um, I don't wanna say legislation, but it is uh, more than a practice. It's based in, um, I should add, if we don't comply, it affects our ability to raise money through grants because we will not be able to secure federal arts funding without paying the car back fee. So it's a, it's a catch-22. It's a real bind for us. And it also hits us at the provincial level. So we get less money because we're unable to pay these fees. Any questions about where we stand in the province? Council Blanchard. Thank you, Richard. Just a quick question. You mentioned the, the three other smaller communities where uh, these community cultural centers exist. Do you know what degree they to what degree do they receive funding from, from the communities? Like what's, what portion of their budget, of their operating budget comes from the municipality? Do you have any idea or any sense um, of that? I can provide that information. I do know that, um, for example, Sussex, the building is owned and operated and maintained by the, by the town of Sussex. In Florenceville, they get um, a quite hefty annual uh, commitment from the town of Florenceville. Bactouche, I believe that the village owns and operates the building. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for your time, but same thing is I don't plan to let it linger. I think there's no reason council has the information before them and uh, they should be discussing it at the next regular council meeting. Read the brochure in your folders and give generously. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Perfect. Uh, the last presentation this evening is uh, the town of St. Andrews and Explorer St. Andrews presentation on the tourism accommodation levy for the 2023 budget. Uh, Mr. Knopper, was the town going to start or was... Uh, our representatives from Explore St. Andrews. The town's going to start your worship. Okay, one floor second. is yours.
not hear uh, the last presentation or maybe see it for all I know. Um, we're just going to take a moment to uh, see if we can get it fixed for Explore to present. And uh, Mr. Knopper has recorded the presentation, so it will be available online through uh, the town uh, social media channels after this meeting as well. If that's Is that correct, Mr. Knopper? So yes, those sir. that missed that can catch it after. I noticed my phone is blowing up. <laughs> Not going to answer a call during council. <laughs> So we'll just give just a moment here to see if we can fix it before uh, it looks like uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy will be presenting this evening. Your Worship, I do have audio back on here, so give me two seconds to share their screen again. Okay. That makes me nervous when you say your phone's blowing up, but there's other people I'm presenting There's, there's at least 7,000 people watching you present right now. Well, the good thing is I'm going to go over a little bit of a, again, so... Um, so I, I, most of us, are you good for us to go? Um, most of uh, us uh, here, I've got the executive from the Tourism St. Andrews board here. Um, Sue Lister is our uh, um, secretary and interim, not secretary, um, treasurer. And then we have uh, Chelsea, who is the vice chair. I am the chair for the 2023 season. So a little bit of a background for people who are at home and uh, for new council members is the Tourism Accommodation Levy Board, which our acronym is TALB. We're working on that. Um, it was originally created as a subcommittee of the Chamber of Commerce uh, for destination marketing. For 2023, uh, which Paul had already alluded to, um, the Explore St. Andrews is deemed a little bit more effective as an independent destination marketing board as an arm of the town of St. Andrews. Um, this reflects part of the changes of the Chamber of Commerce to lean more in terms of economic development. However, our mandate is to work really collaboratively with the Chamber, with the town, with the BIA, with the Regional Service Commission, and with Explore um, New Brunswick. So that there's less duplication of efforts. So there's better communication. I'm really glad that I'm here tonight with the other two presenters because we're sitting in the back going, we could help probably. Um, so increasing that collaboration if there is a tourist component to um, what they're doing and we can help market and it fits the criteria of putting heads in beds and uh, replenishing the fund. Uh, so our mission statement is to position St. Andrews as the preferred destination in Eastern Canada. And our objectives to meet this mission, uh, we effectively market and advertise the destination of St. Andrews and the area outwards to regenerate the fund. Um, you're going to hear heads and beds um, is, is typical because that's how we replenish our fund is to get more people to the accommodations to pay the levy. And there before we have more funds. Uh, we uh, conduct tourism research and develop tourism strategies, uh, increase organizational capacity to meet tourism needs. I know that's really small, but we have larger versions. Um, and also to um, fund tourism focused uh, events, festivals, and product development. Explore St. Andrews um, will achieve this through telling our stories supporting unique events year round and promoting our people and services. I think it's really important to note uh, to people who are new uh, to finding out about our organization is that Saint, uh, Explore St. Andrews, our whole initiative is to focus outward. Uh, so the residents of St. Andrews won't necessarily see the majority of our efforts um, of the board. It, we're deemed successful when our town is busy, when we're vibrant, when people leave here having um, their expectations of their holiday met. Uh, they're doing the word of mouth marketing for us, but also gathering some metrics that we aren't able to necessarily attain yet um, through the Regional Service Commission, through the Welcome Center of which day trippers turned into overnight guests, which people were gonna stay one night have turned into two nights, um, et cetera. I think it's important to note as well that the responsibility of marketing by Explore St. Andrews ends at the threshold of individual businesses. Um, I, that's important to note because individual marketing of businesses and attractions continue to be the responsibility of the business. So we're here to tell stories. We're here to um, talk about initiatives and history, but not a special that a business is putting on. Um, the original stakeholders of the accommodation levy are the overnight visitors of the prior year, and accommodation providers are solely collectors of the levy, 
as a mandated municipal tax and the town of St. Andrews and Explore St. Andrews um, are stewards of the fund. So last year, uh, we put out um, for festival and event funding, $65,000. I'm not gonna go through them all. If there's any questions on particular funding, we can go through it, but it was uh, almost double from 2021. That was obviously a COVID year as well, but last year there, um, there was some great new opportunities that we were able to fund. We invested $16,000 into the Welcome Center, uh, which was up 4,000 from 2021. We have advertising uh, partnerships. We chose Edible Maritimes as our um, advertising partner. Um, we are looking at other ways that we can spread our message, but first of all, um, Edibles Maritimes is a local um, um, editor that is from St. Andrews, so knows our message well, knows our brand well, but also these magazines are put in every hotel room in the Maritimes. Um, the focus as well was that it was a culinary magazine, so that really goes to part of our branding of being a culinary destination as well. Uh, we went to the Saltscapes trade show uh, in Halifax that's held every year, which is a huge tourism uh, trade show. But our big spend last year was the launch of our website. Uh, that was an arduous process, took much longer than we thought. It is live. Um, and uh, we're, that, was a, that was the big spend for last year. Um, if we go to this year, I think that Paul has talked a little bit about the total collected, the Regional Service Commission, which is a mandated fee. Um, I've had a chance to speak to the Regional Service Commission uh, uh, representative, and um, they seem very willing to collaborate. So I can expand on that at another time if you'd like. Um, so what was left over for us was almost $260,000. We retained $108,000 from last year, and that was particularly because we had that set aside for an employee. Um, the employee didn't get hired um, because of several reasons, most of which being that the Regional Service Commission um, was changing things and we thought we would hold off. Uh, I don't want to go line by line, but I'll go over some of the main ones. Uh, the advertising is reprinted material, rack cards, postcards uh, for trade shows for um, our welcome center, the advertising budget for edibles. Um, we have set aside for 2023 uh, quite a large portion for a statement ad. So much like Cavendish, much like uh, Lunenberg, um, who also partner with their uh, provincial partners, they also pack their own parachute and do uh, their own advertising. And <clears throat> excuse me, that's where we're looking for that big um, budget spend. Uh, the Community Projects and Anchors Awards, uh, that's really uh, dedicated to retaining talent in St. Andrews. So it's recognizing <laughs> recognizing um, talented tourism uh, employees and uh, celebrating them and getting people to not be transient in our community to build roots. Uh, this year, we have $75,000 set, uh, set aside for festivals and events. We have uh, had a request, it has not been approved yet, for a Welcome Center grant of 18,000 from the Chamber of Commerce. Our website is live and it's, it's good, but we also wanna develop more. So we wanna add tabs for conventions, for weddings. Um, we wanna add itineraries to there. We wanna add the trails to there. Um, so that is uh, an ongoing investment. Our social media um, strategy right now, we have Steady Creative, which is doing our social media on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we've got almost 2000 uh, followers on Explore St. Andrews on Instagram and 1700 on Facebook. Um, our viewership and our likes and our um, have gone up 39% just in the last month since they've taken over um, managing that. So that was a good investment on our behalf. Once we have an employee in place, that is gonna change. Um, we'll start to do that in-house. Uh, planning uh, and trade shows. Um, oh, sorry, trade shows, we have 2,500. That's for Saltscapes again this year. And our the planning budget there, 
um, is really strategic so that we have a multi-year plan um, uncovering hidden um, opportunities for us to explore. Uh, the other big spend here is our staffing expense and the associated costs that go with that um, are computers, phones, uh, rent, uh, perhaps motor vehicle expenses. We also have a budget set aside for uh, on-site hosting of meetings that's bringing in our partners from Explore New Brunswick, from the Regional Service Commission, um, if we're hosting them here. And then we've, uh, this is a new budget line for this year, which is our FAM development and assistance, which we've allocated $15,000 for. Um, is, is anybody not familiar with uh, FAM is? It's a familiarization tour. So anybody that's thinking uh, that St. Andrews might be a great destination for a convention, um, for travel writers, for media, for things like Hallmark movies, um, they send a group of delegates here to suss us out. <laughs> and it's really helping spread some of those costs um, out for when they come here and dining experiences and staying at um, hotels, that sort of thing. So we wanted to make sure that we were a partner in that. I'm, that was my last line. <laughs> Zero minutes. Zero minutes. Zero minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Council. I'll pass it over to you. But before I do, I, I've uh, seen a few draft budget, and this is the most detailed one we've actually ever received from Explore St. Andrews. So I know transparency is one thing that you're aiming for. So well done to the treasurer. Should I give uh, the treasurer credit? But uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, it does show a clear picture. Council, any questions on anything in the presentation, though? I know we did have an opportunity to meet uh, with Explore St. Andrews. Um, and we had a lot of great conversation then, but this specifically to this presentation, is there any questions? I'm seeing none. So I think we've, we've talked plenty. So thank you. That was more Perfect. of a presentation to let the public know exactly what was going on. So we really appreciate uh, both Mr. Knopper and Mrs. Kennedy for, for doing that this evening. All right, council. So uh, we will move on the agenda. Uh, the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. So we do that uh, at the first meeting of the month. So nothing for this evening. We do have something under communications though this evening. We've got actually a motion. Uh, and I think it probably makes sense just to kick off the motion. That will be through the chair, Councillor Gumashal on page uh, 21 uh, in regards to uh, Epilepsy Association of the Maritimes. Thank you, Worship. Uh, reference number RCS 230308. The dated March 15th, submitted by myself, and the subject is Epilepsy Association of Maritimes Purple Day, March 26, 2023, Proclamation. And the background reads, the town of St. Andrews has received a request from the Epilepsy Association of the Maritimes, EAM, to designate March 26, 2023, as Purple Shirt Day. EAM has been providing education, programming, and support for persons living with epilepsy and their families in the maritime provinces for over 40 years. They provide education and awareness to workplaces, schools, and community groups about supporting people with epilepsy and how to respond if someone has a seizure. They provide scholarships and bursaries to youth living with epilepsy to pursue post-secondary education. And there are attached documents to this report for their request letter and a copy of the proclamation. And the motion reads that the <clears throat> that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews supports Epilepsy Association of the Maritimes with the proclamation of Purple Day on March 26, 2023. And I'll make that motion, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you. Seconder. I've got uh, Councillor Bennett. Uh, any discussion on this one? Okay, seeing now, I'll call the question. All in favor of approving this proclamation, please signify by saying aye. 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 That is everybody. I'll read it right now. This is the Town of St. Andrews Epilepsy Awareness Purple Day 2023 proclamation. Whereas Purple Day is a global effort dedicated to promoting epilepsy awareness in countries around the world. Whereas epilepsy is one of the most common neurological conditions estimated to affect over 50 million people worldwide and 42 people in Canada diagnosed every day. And whereas one in 10 persons will have at least one seizure during his or her lifetime, and whereas the public is often unable to recognize common seizure, seizure types uh, on how, or how to respond with appropriate first aid, and whereas Purple Day will be celebrated on March 26th annually to increase understanding, reduce stigma, and improve the quality of life for people with epilepsy through the country and globally. Now, therefore, I, Brad Henderson, Mayor of the Town of St. Andrews, do hereby proclaim March 26, 2003, as Purple Day in the Town of St. Andrews as an effort to raise awareness of epilepsy in Canada and urge all citizens to support this initiative. It witnessed where 
whereof I have set my hand and caused the seal of mayorality of the town of St. Andrews to be affixed here too. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Council, for that. That does wrap up uh, communications. Uh, there is no staff uh, financial report. That will be the first meeting of the month as well. So we're going to move right in to the introduction, consideration, and passing of bylaws and motions. The first one is a discussion. It's a discussion for bylaw process to address requests from Bayside and Shamcook. Uh, I note that the staff report was submitted by Mr. Knopper, so I think I'll hand it over, or Mr. Spear, doesn't matter to me, whichever of the two would like to uh, start off, but uh, maybe just a quick summary just for uh, the public and council's information. I am. Okay, I'll try again. <laughs> yeah, please none, yell. <laughs> not, nonetheless, um, what is in place is still the provincial regulations that are out there. And so in order, to, 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 the town doesn't have jurisdiction, but that doesn't mean we're trying to help people. And so as complaints come in, we're trying to go through the bureaucracy of, of who is responsible. So as opposed to the town where you'd come to the town hall and we'd figure out the bylaw enforcement officer, the RSC or whatever, the jurisdictions are handled just by individual departments out there. And if it's a land planning issue, it still goes back to the Southwest New Brunswick Service Commission. And so a couple of weeks ago, we started to get a couple of complaints and we might've erroneously pushed people to the RSC, misunderstanding what they were looking for. But we've talked internally with staff and say, everything's handled by us right now. We'll figure out the final answer and we'll go from there. And so we're actively working to try to, and we've had a meeting with the local service manager, Darren McCabe, who would have looked after the bylaws prior to the local government reform back in the day. And he gave us a, two or three contacts is, is all they really had. And so that will be our first go-to as best we can. What needs to be done for the town is that we really have to extend our bylaws out there, that it's more than just, you know, three readings and saying, adding the jurisdiction that. We want to make sure that the bylaws, so like the animal control bylaw, for instance, what works in the old St. Andrews is going to work in the new expanded rural areas. I think it's a priority, and I know there's a couple of issues that, that are up there. And so we have been talking with legal to, to try to figure out routes to a couple of these, but it's going to take a little bit of time on some of these issues. And for those that we can have any effect on, we are contacting the provincial agencies that are overseeing it as best we can and, and trying to put a hurry on or try to guide people through or at least put them in contact with specific landowners who can work out that through them. So we're just, you know, from our standpoint, there's a couple of issues that come up, but one might be the animal control bylaw that we have to look at. I think the, re the zoning application, the rezoning bylaw or the zoning bylaw is going to have to be looked at sooner rather than later. It's complicated, but it can control a lot of this stuff better than any other bylaws. And so we may have to put a bit of a priority. Uh, council will be going to priority planning in the next three weeks. And that's when you can, you know, kind of say if that's where you want to go. But staff is working hard and diligently to try to, to deal with these things with hardly any guidance and little forewarning. So we, we apologize to anybody we gave bad advice to, but we've corrected that internally. And uh, we're going to try to work with all our new residents and try to figure out a way to, to solve any things that come up. Understanding there's only still limited regulations out there until we extend our bylaws as a community to those areas. Thank you very much, Mr. Spear, for that summary. So um, I'll open it up to council, of course. Uh, but I think uh, the number one challenge is, is if I live in Shamcook Bayside, I have no idea where to go for anything right now. Um, call it what it is. I've been critical in the past. There was no effort uh, in the past made. I'm not pointing fingers at the municipality, so you can pick what other level of government. But there was nothing that communicated where you go for anything. If I'm in Shamcook Bayside, I'm going to call town hall because all I know is I'm part of the town of St. Andrews now. And it would be pretty frustrating to call town hall and say, hey, we don't actually deal with that. It's not our fault because we didn't set it up that way. But, you know, you go to the roads, the roads aren't us, right? You go to bylaw enforcement. Last I checked, 
Shamcook Bayside was not paying for bylaw enforcement to the town of St. Andrews. Is that correct? correct? So confusing for us, we have to be the ones to implement it, but we're not getting paid for it. So it's, there's a lot of flaws and I don't think we're going to solve it overnight, but we at some point are going to need to make a presentation to the residents of St. Andrews because they're wondering what's happening in the awards, but also more important for the wards to say, if this is what you're wondering, this is where you go. And I'll be honest, I'm the mayor of this community and I'm confused at some of them because I don't think we've been provided guidance. Um, I could be wrong on that, but it's it's not very clear right now. So we have a challenge because you're going to get more and more phone calls to town hall and not be able to provide any guidance at no fault of your own, but we need to get there. So I don't know if there's someone from the Department of Local Government that can come in here and make a presentation to say, hey, these are the ones that we're still in charge of, or at least the province is. So this is where you go. Everything else goes to the town. Like that's where I think we need to get to because I don't know about everyone around this table. Are, are you clear? I'm not. So that says a lot. Your Worship, May, Your Worship I'd like to address that if I could, please. Excuse me, Chris. Yep. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, uh, with, with uh, local government reform effective January 1st uh, and the fact that the province pulled down all the, the past bylaws that uh, represented the communities of Bayside and Shamcook, that makes it quite clear what the province's responsibilities and their direction is. Uh, when they pull down all those former bylaws and pull them right off their sites, uh, it, it, it appears to anybody who's looking and in taking this uh, very serious uh, that they've washed their hands of, of the local communities and believe that now, unfortunately, as of January 1st, all the responsibility lies upon the shoulders of this community and the council. So if if that's a wrong assumption by someone who's been spending a lot of time looking at this subject and dissecting the different rules and, and the application of what's going on, and in the middle of a couple of complaints uh, from local residents, um, I think it would be really important, like what you're saying, is addressing this with the communities and maybe putting out a mail out and telling them what our responsibilities are that we know and timelines on when they can expect to receive some of the services that should be part of our community but are going to take that time because of uh, a delay in getting bylaws drafted and inclusive to uh, Bayside and Shamcook. Is that not a reasonable solution in the interim before we can provide a full range of uh, services to the community that we at least inform the people of what's expected? I think we're, Council Ben, I think we're saying the same thing. There's got to be an education component there. Uh, it's just before we do the education, we need to make sure we're getting it right. Um, just because I don't think we know everything around what the province's plans are. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, I think we're still sorting through this. So I don't know if there's an opportunity for the Department of Local Government to have a meeting with senior staff, the mayor, council, from the wards, whatever. I think we need to get some clarity on who's doing what right now. And once we have that, then to cascade information and a town mail out seems well, if not something as simple too as a link that will show some information about it. I do know that the timeline will be tough um, just because when you get into bylaws, like a zoning bylaw to set yourself on a clock is a very dangerous game to get into because you want to hear from the public and it can, it can slow it down. And that's a good thing. That's democracy. But um, I would say to update all the bylaws for Shamcook Bayside uh, could take, and I, I don't mean to be, no, uh, I don't so mean to be against, but it could take years. <laughs> your your worship, just on that, a typical bylaw can take up to a standard basic bylaw can take up to three months, depending on what it is. Last time council went through the zoning bylaw and the municipal plan amendments, it took two years. That was with multiple consultations, multiple public feedback inputs, multiple workshops. So just I'm just trying to establish a, a timeline and an understanding of uh, where we need where we are now and where we need to get to. And every bylaw needs to be reviewed. So we have over 40 plus bylaws on our docket from the town. Each and every bylaw needs to come forward. And that's where council it is be follow staff will follow your priorities for which direction you want to go with what bylaws and when. And that's why the strategic planning session with council in April is important. So to Councilor Bennett's point though, I think it'd be good if we knew that these are the ones we're going to attack first. Those are the ones that we communicate in a mail out to say, these are the ones that we are going to be discussing in the upcoming couple months, right? And we pick away at them as quick as possible. But that being said, quick isn't transparent. So uh, it can be timely. Councilor Harlan, I saw your hand. So just to clarify, um, Chris, what you said was 
from here on, any complaints, people are directed to call the town office. And those complaints, just as they are for the old town of St. Andrews, they are tracked, right? So what I understood is that there's a recording process that um, Annette Harland registered a complaint. There's a formal process and it's tracked on a, uh, um, on a transparent process, right? So we can communicate that out to all residents of the municipality to say the town hall is who we go to if you have a complaint and that the complaints will be tracked and town and town staff will do their very best in terms of trying to find out um, the answers of how this gets mitigated until we address all of the bylaws, right? Which will be a lengthy process, which I think I, I just have to say, we expected that to be a lengthy process. And I at least expected there to be lots of bumps in the road as we go through municipal reform as of January 1st. We can't um, switch the the process on a dime. It will take time. Um, and I understand the frustration in terms of working with the provincial government. And I understand that there's lots of layers around all of that. That's not, I, I think it's really important to um, clarify that that is not town staff's, um, they're not responsible for those glitches. It's a far larger issue. So I think that's really important. But is this not something that we could put on our website in the interim to say if there is an issue that people can call the town office? There is a formal complaint process. This is the way it is. The complaints are registered and town staff will work to, to mitigate the best that they can until we go through the process of reforming the bylaws. It makes sense. I'll go to you one second, Councillor. But just to be clear on that comment, if the Glebe Road doesn't have enough salt, do they call Town Hall? No. That's, no. There's, that's, that's where I'm going here, right? Yeah. So it's, it, it's not a one-stop shop like we want to pretend. If there's not enough salt in the Glebe Road, you shouldn't be calling Town Hall, correct? Your, your, correct. your Worship, that's correct. However, we do have contact information to the proper number right. to call DCI so that's for those complaints. So. Right. Although not necessarily to call, like if you don't know, it's still best to to register an issue with the town and at least we can follow up with a phone number or who to appropriately contact in that light. So, so I think what the focus to summarize this, and I, I did see your, your hand, Councillor Heenan, is with what we do know, we should be putting the educational component out there. Uh, if you have this, this is where you go. When in doubt, call Town Hall and we'll try to direct you the best we can, right? So, Councillor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship and Council. Um, just to know, do you know how many people that I spoke with and complained to me in Sham Cook and Bayside about not wanting our bylaws to be enforced in their LSDs? So having said that, we asked at, uh, the minister this question when we were in the meetings in Fredericton in October, and it was specifically clear that the town of St. Andrews would follow their own bylaws until such times as we could rewrite the bylaws and get them approved for all the municipalities. I agree with there needs to be some education to this, but I totally agree with you, Councillor Hartle, that, that there are bumps in the road and there are there are issues that we have to deal with and they're very hard issues. So somewhere along the line, we have to, we have to keep this under control until we as a council can come up with a suitable way to appease most people in all of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ian. Uh, go to Council Ware, but I think staff's getting clear direction that I, we're as a municipality, there's there's nothing coming down from any other level of government. So the municipality is gonna have to take ownership for our residents and try to communicate the best we can. Mm -hmm. Councillor Ware. Yeah, I'd just like to comment on the, the people in the outlying areas uh, during the entire election process. That was the one issue that came up. Are we gonna be able to stay away from the town bylaws? And uh, the majority of the population might be as high as 90%, with no appetite at all for these bylaws to be extended out into the into the wards. Now, I say the wards, the ward of Bayside. 
an appetite for it at all. So. Yeah, I, I've heard similar, uh, and uh, I'm personally, as a member of this council, I'm going to be leaning on our ward representatives to really help guide us on what the ward, the residents of the wards want. I, uh, I could just talk from the original. We had some conversations as the the old six councillors and myself, and uh, I don't think anyone in, in that lives in the municipality had any real desire to really get into the bylaws that are out in the LSD. So we'll be uh, looking for the the representatives from the wards to really help guide that process for us. I think I can speak for all of us that we were pretty clear on that when we were facing uh, where we are today. So, uh, but if we all do it together, I think we'll get to a positive spot if we, you know, but I, I am looking for leadership from three individuals at this table for sure. And uh, I do, I will say though, that I'm surprised already. There is requests coming in for us to review bylaws and potentially make changes, which again, to your point, that's probably could be the 10% for all I know, but there is, there is requests. So we do have to look at them. All right. Uh, unless there's anything new, I, I think staff's got directions on we, we'll have to take the leadership position and trying to communicate to not just the wards, but again, the residents of the old St. Andrews, because they want to know as well. Um, all right. Is there anything else on that one? Or I'll turn because we do have a big agenda. OK. All right. So that uh, we're getting into bylaws now. So I will pass it over to Deputy Mayor Akaji for the next one or for sorry, for motions rather. Thank you. And it's uh, the Market Wharf, Wharf Project update motion. Did I skip one? FA 230316.docx. Uh, so the background is this. At the regular council meeting of March the 6th, 2023, council was provided an update on the wharf and concerns regarding fire suppression protection with the new weight restrictions. Provided with this report is the background on the wharf project updates and, uh, and options for fire suppression. It is recommended that council approve the unbudgeted funds of $13,000 to purchase new fire hoses and a manifold to be placed on a trailer for use by the fire department. So the motion is this, that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews approves the unbudgeted funds of $13,000 for the purchase of 800 feet of four inch hose and a manifold with a four inch intake and a three, 32 and a half discharge connections for fire suppression for the market wharf. And I so move, Your Worship. Perfect. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We do have a staff report. We will visit it probably in the debate, just so everyone's aware. Uh, but I just wanted to get it on the table first. Could I have a seconder for that motion? We've got Councillor Hurdle winning that one. Um, so we have a mover and a seconder. There is a staff report. Is there anything, Mr. Spear, yeah. Mr. Knopper, you want to add to this one? Sorry, Your Worship, just one clarification. It's an intake and three two and a half inch discharges. So oh, it's just for three two and a half. Thank you. I thought that was funny. 32 and a half inch. <laughs> Discharge. I was thinking one big, that's not going to come out of a four inch pipe, no, no. but I was waiting for Councillor Neil to correct me. The, the, the wharf would be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very safe with that one. Uh, all right. Uh, members of, I guess, Mr. Dopper, Mr. Spears, is there anything you want to add? I know there is the report attached. I'm assuming all members of council have reviewed it. Um, uh, is there anything you want to add? I also would like to maybe put Councillor Neil on the spot to think of me with his experience. If he thinks that that would work for a sol potential solution as uh, it is a concern um, with the wharf this operating season in particular. Floor is anyone who wants it. I can start just so council's aware and um, that we actually talked, it was between the ops manager and the acting fire chief that came up with a solution. Um, we had talked uh, Councillor Weir talked about earlier too, about putting in like a, a temporary line, if you will, from the from the town right up to the end of the wharf. But it really is two problems. A, it's two hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot of money, and for something that may get ripped up because we still got to replace that section of the wharf. So there's a concern there that it just you know we need all the money we can get just to do the refurbishment without putting in temporary fixes. And so we talked to uh, 
acting chief uh, Craig, and he thought this would do. He, he said, there's two possibilities. We could leave the trailer out there so it's readily available and it's up to the department. We can make that work or if they'd like it stationed at the fire hall. So for instance, if they had a forest fire, which they do through the spring, they could maybe if it works, drag it out with them there and that'd give them an extra 800 meters of hose, which is close to half a mile. I'm not so sure of the logistics not just me talking about that. So the, the, the Councillor Neil could talk about that better. But we think from a cost perspective and a safety perspective, especially in the short term, that this is the way to go because we're hopefully we're only talking about a one year problem. And you, then you would have this infrastructure in place for years down the road as additional, whether it's kept in the trailer or kept in storage and replaced as other hoses um, need replacement. Thank you, Mr. Spear. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot. If, but if there's anything you want to add or anything, I, you know a lot more about that than I do. How about that? Yes, Your Worship. Yeah, I got a few things I'd like to add to it. Um, yeah, I, like again, I appreciate the work staff has done with this with, uh, again, the acting chief. Um, but I think there was a little bit of miscommunication with regards to that first request and the fact that it being tied into a water main. So Basically, the initial recommendation from the fire department was that we just put a hard line from basically the front of the wharf to the head of the wharf that would just sit empty all summer long, all winter long, for that matter. At the base of the wharf, that would just be threaded so that as a fire truck approaches, the fire truck would then connect to that the same way we would do to a hydrant. And as that process is taking place, the three quarter ton truck is already down at the end of the wharf stretching attack lines. So basically, as soon as water is available, there's firefighters at the end of hoses ready to put it on the fire. So that would be sort of the initial recommendation from the fire department um, and the communication I've had with them. Um, the only concerns I see with the 800 feet of four inch hose is that I, I honestly don't think it's going to save us a whole lot of time versus my initial concern was stretching them. Um, four and a half inch hose doesn't come off even the back of a trailer as nicely as, you know, when we're pulling off inch and three quarter lines off the back of the trucks. Um, so it is still gonna be a relatively slow process of that truck and trailer with firefighters walking behind it, sort of pulling that off by hand. And then you have to add to that, then is connected to the truck. You then be connecting attack lines at the end of that. And at that time, again, I think the major concern was that we could potentially be into a wharf fire as opposed to a boat fire. Um, so for that reason, and the only other comment I had was, again, um, the purchase of it, again, I know you mentioned it could potentially be used other places. Um, that four inch line basically is not going to be used anywhere that we don't have hydrants. So as soon as we get out of the rural areas or into the rural areas, Sham Cook Bayside, um, there really is no use for it. Um, it's just far too heavy to be pulling, lugging, like for a forest fire or anything like that. So, um, so for that reason, again, I, my suggestion, I'd like to make a motion that we table this until we can get sort of a quote on just the hard line. Um, running the length of the wharf uh, with that manifold on the other end of it. And then again, we could even, um, I, the fire department would have enough two and a half inch line that they could have a few lengths stored out there in a box of some kind um, that again would be readily available for firefighters to start deploying as again, the truck is hooking into that main line. Perfect. Well, that's, uh, I'm glad I put you on the spot. Um, Probably should have told you before the meeting, though. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Spear, uh, you're going to getting the quote for the hard line makes sense. It's important to note on the hard line, from my understanding, because the hard line something that could remain at the wharf once it's done as well. Would that not help fire suppression in the future? Like if we kept yeah, it there, is, for the, like, you know what I mean? Like, would that make the wharf safer in the future as well by having that there? Absolutely. Again, I was talking with the fire chief today and uh Again, we both agree that's something that could be incorporated into the new wharf design, um, even the existing one, if it was there. Again, remove it, put it back in place. Um, it would definitely have advantages to, again, attacking fires at the end of the wharf, not having to put the truck out there. 
um, is safer too, right? Than having a happens, truck. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I think it would be let's and something that we could use moving forward. All right, um, Councilor Ware. Well, I support uh, what Councilor Neagle says a hundred percent. Port Bayside set a hard line for fifty three years and uh, works excellent. Uh, we had the advantage of having a six inch lime with 140 pounds of pressure <laughs> at the edge of the wharf. So we had something to tie into. Don't have that benefit here. But uh, the hard lime works exceptionally well. You run it down under the edge of the wharf and uh, it lasts forever. All right, well, uh, unless there's any other then staff, do you look? <laughs> Yeah, need to say I need to have a mover, but staff, you support that recommendation as well. Just yeah, to, yeah. all right. So, so unless someone has anything new, I will be looking for. Uh, I've got a mover technically to table. I need a second or Councillor Bennett. Um, any discussion on the tabling? Okay, all in favor of tabling, please signify by saying aye. Aye. We are moving on. Thank you. Um, and thank you for that, uh, both staff and Councillor Neal. Uh, we are now into public works with uh, Councillor Blanchard. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so reference number PW230313, uh, amendments to bylaw number 18-01, vehicular bylaw one-way water street and bus stops for 2023. So with the, the upcoming approach to the spring and summer seasons, staff is seeking council approval to make water street a one-way direction. Since 2020, the town has been making water street a one-way street. Originally, the one-way street was put in place to support the widening of sidewalks during COVID. However, it has become a useful process for supporting positive traffic flows in the downtown, creating space for delivery, delivery vehicles and, and creating a safer pedestrian environment. Staff is proposing the following. Uh, one-way water street from Edward Street to Frederick Street from Monday, May 15th, 2023 to Monday, October 16th, 2023. Restricting, and then secondly, uh, restricting parking on side streets along Water Street. And this has been done to ensure there is room for traffic flow through the side streets. A new addition to the 2023 summer season is the hop on hop off bus from the, uh, from the partnership group led by the Huntsman Marine Science Center. In order to allow for the bus stops, they must be added to the vehicular bylaw. There will be seven stops in total. Uh, only three stops have to be indicated in the bylaw as they are on public property. The four other stops are on private property and do not need to be added to the bylaw. So note that the date for operations is noted from May to October. This will allow the Huntsman to operate a soft launch of the bus and support fall events. So the motion that is before council uh, is that the council of the town of St. Andrews approves the one-way water street from Monday, May 15th, 2023 to Monday, October 16th, 2023 from Edward Street to Frederick Street under Schedule C uh, One-way street of bylaw number 18-01, a bylaw to regulate vehicular traffic in the town of St. Andrews, and I so move. Thank you, a seconder, for that motion. We've got Deputy Mayor Akerji for that one. Uh, discussion? All in favor of approving this motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. It's everybody that has been approved. Next one. Okay, the next motion, that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews approves no parking anytime along the following streets from Monday, May 15th, 2023 to October, or to Monday, October the 16th, 2023. And uh, it reads as follows, Elizabeth Street, and that is Water Street to Queen Street on the southwest side, Edward Street, Water Street to Queen Street, uh, southeast side. Okay. Uh, William Street, uh, from Water Street to Queen Street on the southeast side. Princess Royal Street, from Water Street to Queen Street on the southwest side. Uh, Queen Street, from Elizabeth Street to Princess Royal Street on the south side. And that is under Schedule B, no parking anytime of bylaw number 18-01, a bylaw to regulate vehicular traffic in the town of St. Andrews, and I so move. Seconder. I got Councillor Heenan. Discussion on that one. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. Everybody again, that has been carried. Next one. Next one, that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews approves the following bus stop locations for the hop on, hop off bus from Monday, May 1st, 2023 to Monday, October the 30th, 2023. 
is at Water Street and Elizabeth Street on the south side, Water Street at Princess Royal Street on the south side, and the W.C. O'Neill Arena Complex Suite 5 Welcome Center. It's 24 Reed Avenue. Under Schedule A, bus stops of bylaw number 18-01, a bylaw to regulate vehicular traffic in the town of St. Andrews, and I so move. Thank you, Councillor Blanchard, and Councillor Neal will be quick to second uh, discussion on that one. Call the question. All in favor of this third and final motion on this one, please signify by saying aye. That's everybody that has been carried, and we're on to tenders, Councillor Blanchard. All right. Uh, PW230314, subject is tendering of TSA 2023-03, Alexandra Crescent Water, Sanitary, and Storm Sewer Upgrades. So as part of the 2023 capital budget, Council budgeted $681,000. HST rebate included for the replacement of water, sanitary, and storm sewers on Alexandra Crescent. This is the final phase of a project to replace in-ground infrastructure that started several years ago. The Town of St. Andrews issued tender 2023-03, Alexandra Crescent water, sanitary, and storm sewer upgrades on Thursday, February 16th, 2023. We had four contractors submit for the tender. The tender closed on Thursday, March the 2nd, 2023. Please see the attached bid summary document from CBCL Limited for details on the bid submitted. <clears throat> the lowest bid for the tender came in at $711,689, HST included. The original budget for this project was $681,000, but after the engineering fees, the project cost is $51,000 over budget at $730,000. The lowest tender bid was $115,000 lower than the next proponent. On the attached staff report, we recommend continuing with this project, but deferring the third water and sewer projects through upgrades to Champlain Avenue until 2024. With that and the availability of reserve funds, the utility fund is still in a strong financial position. So the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews awards tender TSA 2023-03, Alexandra Crescent Water Sanitary and Storm Sewer Upgrades to Fairville Construction for the amount of $781,689, HST included, and I so move. Thank you, a seconder for that one. We've got Councillor Heenan again. We'll open up for discussion. We are seeing consistently that tenders are coming in higher than and what it is it is a sign of the times unfortunately so hopefully that isn't a path forward because it's 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 a lot of money that we're we're consistently having to put in over um but uh we're not alone in that i can confirm that all municipalities are experiencing that as well um any other discussion okay call the question all in favor of that motion please signify by saying aye it's everybody so that tender has been awarded um, that should wrap up Councillor Blanchard. Uh, Councillor Neal uh, has an easy night after weighing in on the first one related to the fire, I guess. But we're going to go on to uh, business, tourism, heritage, and uh, culture for Councillor Hurdle. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, so this is in reference to BTHC 230303. Um, it does state here that it's submitted by Councillor Blanchard. So I think that might be a, just a small change we'll have to make uh, um, in, in the minutes. Uh, but the background this is, subject is the Canada Day road closure request for 2023. The background is as part of the Canada Day celebrations for 2023, town staff are seeking the usual road closures of Water Street and the closure of Market Square for most of the day and from Augustus to Harriet to accommodate the parade. So the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews approves the road closures and closure of Market Square for the Canada Day 2023 celebrations on Saturday, July 1st, 2023 with the following streets and times. And that would be a main road closure from 7 a.m. until 11 p.m., Water Street at Elizabeth Street, Water Street at Edward Street, Water Street at William Street, Water Street at King Street, and Water Street at Frederick Street. And a temporary closure from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, it's King Street at Queen Street to accommodate for the farmer's market. Uh, closure of Market Square from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Support for road closure for the parade starting at 1 p.m. from NBCC and Augusta Street to Harriet Street to the W.C. O'Neill Arena Complex. And I so move. Thank you, seconder, for that one. I've got Councillor Harlan. Discussion? It's an annual one that we do. Okay, all in favor of approving 
these, I guess you could say road closures, please signify by saying aye. It's everybody that motion has been carried. Uh, the next ones I believe are more um, discussion items. So uh, first one is in regret relation to the request from uh, TALB tourism accommodation levy bylaw. Uh, so it's a discussion and it's related to, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to staff actually at this time. I believe it would be over to Chris, Mr. Spear at this point. Your worship, we had discussions. We met with the accommodations levy board last week and my initial uh, memo was made from my understanding that they were going to provide us with a formal request, which didn't come along yet. So I'm just wondering if we could table my report until that comes along to make sure it aligns with their formal request is. It's just on the organiz their organization. Perfect. Uh, just a quick motion to table. Should I have a motion to table this item? I've got uh, Deputy Mayor Akaji, a second of a Councillor Neal. All in favor of tabling, please signify by saying aye. That's been tabled. We'll revisit it with the formal request. Uh, we are sticking to uh, the tourism accommodation levy, though. This is a discussion on bylaw number 23-01, a bylaw relating to the tourism accommodation levy in the town of St. Andrews. Um, so you did have the hearing of objections well as well. Thank you very much. Uh, there has been some letters that have come in, uh, and uh, staff has got a few recommendations um, before we go to second reading. So I'll pass it back over to senior staff. Uh, I believe this one might be Mr. Knopper. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. So, uh, Council, you've uh, received all the letters of correspondence that have come in. Uh, we hosted the public hearing of objections, so you've heard the majority of the processes that have come through. Uh, the report in front of you summarizes where staff feels that the changes can be, so I just want to note these. Um, so the following uh, were part of the objections and changes requests. So Council options. Um, so right now you're at first reading of the bylaw public hearing of objections before you is second and third reading. So uh, I recommendations is to change section 4.1. So to make this a little more clear uh, as regards to April 1st or uh, the anticipated passing of the bylaw that that is when the new uh, date of the new bylaw kicks off and that will take effect. So any bookings that are currently registered now. So if council chooses to stick with 3.5% in the bylaw, any bookings taken after the April 1st, 2023 would be subject to the new bylaw or the new amount versus what is subject right now at 3%, uh, as well as that extends out into the, the, the wards areas. So any bookings that are taken prior to that as of right now would not be effective on that bylaw. So there was clarification asked for that. Section 7.1 uh, changes uh, the wording from purchaser to guest. Guest is used throughout the entire bylaw. Purchaser was used once within it. So it makes sense to change that. That's a easy change uh you will you had correspondence in regards to um the the penalties and, and administrative penalties in regards to this so i did a thorough deep dive on the local governance act and how it regulates and how it speaks to it realistically the only change i would recommend with that is section 4.1.1 and 4.1 to 0.5 to that is to add minimum and maximum to the fines that are listed uh, because we can up the because the fines are done with on a daily basis for as within the process a new fine is issued every day it is not doubling the fines it is issuing a new fine every day for the process and eventually we would get up to the courts but to note at this point the farthest i've ever gotten is a warning letter and most people have been in full compliance so it's it's more there like in all of our by other bylaws that if we need to go to those measures, we will, but most of the time we have very good education and very good compliance within it, so, but should be listed and modified slightly. Uh, Schedule A, uh, sections 3.1.3 and 3.1.4 should, instead of reflecting as two-thirds and one-third, should be reflected as 66.66% and 33.33%. That way, it's there's the arbitrariness of that. It's divided. Here's the full percentages uh, for the distribution and listing it as two thirds. Um, council, you have options to consider what, as it comes to the Regional Service Commission. Uh, note there was uh, some concerns about section 10.7 as it states now currently. Um, right now, we know the charge to the town is $28,000 this year for the Regional Service Commission. There was concern that additional funds would be drawn on more from this. Note that the Service Commission's levy to the town is based on population and assessment. And that is across the board for Eastern Charlotte, for St. Stephen, for all the communities that are within the RSC region here. In the event they request more funds, everybody's funds would be moved up. The question is, is council comfortable with 
drawing from the tourism accommodation levy funds to cover that cost or not? And do you want to install a cap or not? So council needs to give direction on that to staff, or do you want to strike it completely from the bylaw and look at it as a, as a levy against the residents of St. Andrews? So I need direction or staff needs direction on that. Um, but for the most part, that would, uh, that concludes the majority of the changes, schedule A lists. Yep, letter submitted. Does he have any follow-up? Only minor follow-up. Uh, the clerk certainly hit on everything that we need to hit, but on the section 4.1, we're saying April the 1st, but since we aren't going to readings tonight, it'll be have to be effective the date or given a little bit of time to educate people when the effective date is. So once we see a direction from council, that might get amended so you aren't surprised by the time the final version of the bylaw comes across your uh, agenda packages. All right, that makes sense. So council, uh, there's recommendations of staff. The one thing they're looking for clarity on, and then we'll talk about if we accept them all or not, would be uh, the cap for uh, the regional service commission uh, over to you. I think it's just leave it as is. If it goes up to $150,000, for example, I don't expect it to. Then at that point, we sit down with Explore St. Andrews as partners and talk about what's reasonable. But I don't think you set a cap on it's just an arbitrary number right now. And I can guarantee you that if it goes up to $150,000. Our friends in St. Stephen will have to pay $200,000 and they're not going to be OK with that. So I really think it's kind of a hypothetical thing more than anything at this time. Council Hurdle. Thank you, Your Worship. Would you mind if I recuse myself from the uh, consensus part? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. By all means. So uh, I guess I'm looking for direction of council. Personally, I think we just leave it in. If it's a great big increase, then yes, we revisit it with our partners. But uh, 40,000 sounds like an arbitrary number to me, is it? Through you, Your Worship, it was an estimation of what a cap could be not okay a, not a hard lot and so again that's... i think if it goes through the roof you're we're going to be one of the last municipalities that probably scream about it there's going to be a lot that tourism is such a small percentage of what their local economy is that they're not going to like it at all right so um over to you council i want to see if that view is is shared along the council table if you agree with that statement just quickly raise your hand just so i can have some consensus all right any opposed seeing none so consensus is that we leave that completely out and we we keep it as is Thank you. so for the rest of the changes i don't know if council hurdle wanted to come back he, it was just the consensus or would he i don't everything in the short term you want seven yeah okay yeah, okay fine. uh all right so council is everyone good with uh the recommendation of staff personally i am the recommendations of staff to include those for second reading Again, at that point, we can debate the overall bylaw, whether you support it or not, but just adding those changes in. Well, seeing head, seeing nods. So, okay, your worship. One, one other question uh, within that: when it comes forward as a for second reading, do you want for second and third reading, or do you want just for second reading? It's a good question, uh, Council. We could go second and third. Um, we did change it though, so it might be good to just do it over two since we made this change. These Thank changes. You, does that make sense? And, and council, sure. just to remind you that for the um, budget presented tonight, you actually have to approve it. So it's not just a thank you for the presentation. You have to actually approve Look, the budget. So we have to be part of that process when we bring this forward. It's a significant amount of money. I think we should do it over two readings. It's one thing if we're doing a second and third on, on uh, you know, not that the BIA isn't, but that's different. It happens every year. No one shows up the hearing of objections. There, there is a letter of, op of opposition or concern to this. Mm -hmm. I think we just spread it out for transparency if everyone's comfortable with that. So. Okay, seeing head nods on that as well. All right, we'll bring uh, Councillor Hurdle back in because that wraps that conversation up, right? Perfect. The next one actually has a motion and it, it is him, so I can't start without him. Thank you, everyone, and sorry for stepping up there, but uh, um, this is in reference to BTHC 230302. Uh, the subject is the update on Charlotte County courthouse engagement process. The background is that at the regular council meeting of March 6th, 2023, council debated the hiring of Broken Shovel Consulting to conduct a visioning exercise for the Charlotte County courthouse. Prior to making a decision on the consultant, Mr. William Bill Hicks, council asked for additional references on the consultation firm. Uh, staff has received feedback on Broken Shovel Consulting from both the City of Fredericton and John Ames, former Minister of Tourism, Heritage and Culture, and Director of Operations for the uh, Beskatomagadi Recognition Group Incorporated. 
Staff would recommend the hiring of Mr. Hicks and his consulting group, Broken Shovel Consulting. And the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews approves the hiring of William Hicks of Broken Shovel Consulting to conduct a visioning exercise for the Charlotte County Courthouse at a cost of $7,000 with funds to come from the initial grant provided by the province of New Brunswick and I so move. Seconder, please. Okay. Deputy Mayor Akaji winning that one. Um, all right, uh, discussion on this one. I know you guys wanted some additional information as my understanding while I was away. It seems like staff has provided that. Is there any discussion or conversation on this one? Okay, I will call the question. All in favor of approving this motion, please signify by saying aye. And any opposed? Seeing none, that has been carried. All right, uh, recreation and community services. There's nothing under uh, this evening. So we are into planning and economic development. Um, it would be Councillor Heenan. Thank you, your worship and staff and councillors. Uh, PED 230307, amendment MP20-07 to the municipal plan PT, P, MP20-01, Henry Hansen, PID 01325505, Rose Lane, Low Density Subdivision. The Town of St. Andrews has received a request for an amendment to the Municipal Plan MP20-01 from Mr. Henry Hansen to allow for a low-density subdivision on PID 01325505 Rose Lane. Please see attached staff report from Mr. Alexander Gopin, Senior Planner, for more details and a copy of the proposed amendment. The report, note, the report notes multiple concerns with the amendment application and that the staff has tried to address these concerns with the performance. However, these have not been re remedied. Due to the concerns, staff is recommending that council defeat the proposed amendment at first reading. Note, if council defeats the motion, this item cannot be addressed for a minimum of six months if the proponent wishes to come back to council. An additional option that council has is to table the motion before you for 60 days to note that council is reviewing the request, but the proponent needs to provide updates based on the planner's concerns. If the concerns are not addressed in 60 days, council can defeat the motion for first reading at the time. So the action, your worship, is that council of the at the council of the town of St. Andrews grant leave for first reading to the amendment MP20-07 to the Town of St. Andrews Municipal Plan MP20-01, Mr. Henry Hansen, PID 01325505, Rose Lane Low Density Subdivision. And I will so move that, Your Worship. Of course, seconder, but I have an update as well that I'll add in with an email that came in late today. Could I have a seconder, though, just to get De Deputy Mayor Akaji? So it's on the table. Uh, council is... Uh... Our planner actually still on the line. Oh, he's right here at the end. <laughs> There's too many. There's too many of us. You got me a plaque and you don't even know I'm here. <laughs> in, in fairness, it wasn't pointing towards me, okay? <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, we have too many people at the table now. I haven't looked that way enough. Over to you. Um, so, yeah, we did uh, actually today I heard from uh, the surveyor who's been working on this for Mr. Hansen and uh, submitted a new site plan that doesn't have the same issues with the subdivision bylaw. Uh, it's just a single lot off of the bar road um, and the Ro and Rose Lane was the issue before. So uh, it would still need the amendment. And I, I think it would be good um, to table it for now so we can just rewrite the report, take that new site plan into consideration, rewrite the bylaw so it matches that site plan, um, but we could bring it back for the next meeting of council. So, Council, you have uh, both staff and now the planner with new updates looking to table it to give us a new staff report. Uh, I'll be looking for a mover to table it. So, I've got Deputy Mayor Akachi, a seconder. Councillor Heenan, any discussions on the tabling? Seeing none. So, all in favor of the tabling, please signify by saying aye. Aye, Your Worship. That has been tabled. Thank you very much for that. The next one is discussion on proposals for affordable housing builds in St. Andrews. Um, and let me just jump ahead here quickly. I don't know if it's Mr. Spear or Mr. Knopper. I think this one's Mr. Knopper. So um, I guess the short of it, if, I, if you want me to just hijack it, is we have people interested in talking to us about um, land, town land. It would be uh, both off Champlain, but also any land in the town of St. Andrews and staff's looking for guidance, I believe, since we did not award the RFP to wonder if we'd like to continue to have discussions on affordable housing. Is that is that a good good summary? 
uh, I think we would be um, silly <laughs> not to welcome in any discussion we can have about affordable housing. So I don't know if anyone sees that any differently, but I, any developer that wants to come forward to the town of St. Andrews to talk about housing, um, okay. personally, my ears are always open. So is that anyone see it differently? I, is that enough direction? We welcome them. So please, by all means, keep them coming. Keep them uh, coming. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there is nothing under new business. So that does bring us into a uh, question period. Is there, I guess uh, at this time, uh, we'll do a call for hands if anyone's online and has a question for this evening. Anybody on uh, Zoom here, uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions. While you're waiting on hands, I'll do the call to the audience and then we can come back to you, Mr. Nopper, if that makes sense. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that has any questions for this evening on anything related to the agenda? Okay, if you want to, if you're, if you're, please come to the microphone. If you're able to come to the microphone just so people online can hear because they won't be able to hear you. Uh, just to be clear, I think they asked a table originally for 60 days. Mr. Knopper said he'll bring it forward to the next regular meeting, actually. Oh, yeah, so it'll be just 60 days. It'll be, what, two weeks? Yeah, two weeks. Than <laughs> April the 4th. April the 3rd. April the 3rd. <clears throat> Is that question there? Any other questions? <laughs> no problem. Thanks for being here. No questions. Seeing none, online. no questions online. Any email submit it? No, Your Worship. Perfect. All right. We are getting into Councilor and Deputy Mayor's comments. Any comment from Councilors or Deputy Mayors this evening? Deputy Mayor Akaji. Thank you, Your Worship. Um I have several. Uh, I asked for bags, you know, the um, carry bags for um, the food banks, and they're still they still need them. If you have extra bags that you're are laying around your house or whatever, they would be handy. And I will deliver um, to the food banks so you can drop them off. I hate to do that to Nancy, but at the town because if they're dropped up at my house, I'm never there. So mm -hmm. if you uh, please be so kind as to drop them off there or call me and I will come and pick them up. I don't have a problem with that. I just think that uh, one thing that the food bank shouldn't have to buy is those bags to put the food in since I won't carry the boxes. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Lenten breakfast every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. in the Anglican Parish Hall that is put on by Ada and Carl Wood. Um, this week is a Western omelet, if you'd like to join us. So it's very, very good food and um, good fellowship and whatnot during the Lenten season. So thanks. Uh, kudos to the Anglican Church again. I'd like to thank uh, Sir James Dunn Academy, which is the school that I graduated from uh, many years ago. Well, I think most of us did. Uh, there's a few graduates from here that um, to thank them for hosting a Kairos blanket exercise. We did one for the students on Friday and it was uh, superbly attended. I think the students got a lot out of it. Um, I had an elder knowledge keeper, knowledge share, from Pabano First Nations who helped me, Constant Sewell. And um, I also had Eva Frost from New Brunswick Community College that helped to facilitate it. And I'd like to thank the Alex, I thank uh, the teacher, Alex Green. He was there and set up chairs and um, for Anglophone School District South for providing us um, the, uh, the ability to host it here. And um, I did fight to have it in our area and I apologize for not opening it up, but I was sure on Saturday I was gonna be full because uh, I had invited councils. I had invited um, uh, uh, many people from different groups. And uh, although we didn't get the 60, 
the group that we had there was quite, it was quite good. And, you know, it was a, quite a good number. We will be hosting another. Uh, so once I know when it will be, I will have it posted with uh, our social media and with everybody else's social media. But I want to thank the students were awesome and the teachers were awesome. And I'd like to thank them for participating. And I'd like to thank council for coming, the council members that did come. I appreciate you coming and participating and hopefully, and to staff that came, uh, both Chris and Paul were there. It was a fantastic morning and uh, I thank them for sharing. Uh, chess continues at the Anglican Church. Parish Hall on Sunday afternoons are preparing for their provincial um, uh, chess meets, which we will again be invited to. But anyway, it it um, the number of kids that are coming to that amazes me because we started that many years in the school system and Nancy Carson and Victoria who have uh, spearheaded it have a great um, deal of parents and are working. Uh, you know, it's just phenomenal the number of students, children, or children that are coming, and they're from kindergarten right up to high school. So I'm very impressed that it has continued to be a successful group, and it's due to the volunteers that do that every week on Sunday afternoon. So I thank you for that, um, Mayor and Council, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I did hear with the chess club that a 10 year old actually uh, beat Councillor Gumashell uh, and eight other people, I think it was. It's spell Wednesday. Perfect. Any other member of council? Councillor Hardlin. I just wanted to um, thank town staff um, as you continue to navigate the um, unchartered waters of municipal <laughs> reform, recognizing that um, there is a lack of clarity. And I'm sure on a daily basis, you are faced with more questions and perhaps um, frustrated residents. Mm -hmm. I trust that we'll all get through it, but I know that you're working diligently at trying to help us all navigate that. And I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And on that point, Councillor Harlan, there is a Yeoman B zone meeting coming up. I'll make sure if you don't have the dates that you get them, it is going to be in St. Andrews. And I have a feeling that we will not be the only municipality that wants to probably talk about some of these challenges at the zone meeting, because uh, if you're following any, any news around Charlotte County, we're not the only municipality right now with challenges around it. There's some that are facing even greater. Councillor Gumashell. Uh, just very quickly wanted to thank staff for taking the time to review some of the uh, security cameras at the wharf and downtown and here at the arena uh, with regard to the uh, the missing person who is sadly uh, recovered. Um, that's very sad for uh, many people in the community. That's the third, third or third anyway in the last few years. So uh, going into budget next year, I hope we'll uh, have a hard look at adding even more cameras um, and uh, expanding that as a as a way to uh, help uh, recover um, loved ones and find leads uh, around uh, those sorts of sad situations. But thank you to staff for taking the extra time to do that. So indeed, thank you, Councillor Gumashell. And uh, when we did attend the RCMP session at the annual uh, Human B conference, uh, RCMP did say the number one thing we can do for support is to help them with more camera assistance. So um, we did add it in the budget for a first time, I think in my time, uh, to just put up cameras to help reduce crime and, and obviously have another eye. Um, but I think it's a worthwhile investment as we continue to aim to make this community safe for all. Uh, any other member of council? Councillor Ware? Uh, just an update on the smolt facility. Uh, I haven't heard it brought up lately. Uh, spring is coming, so the, uh, the activity is picking up. They broke the EIA into two sections, one for the water supply and one for the facility. Appears as though they've passed the EIA for the for the water supply. And now they're starting on grubbing and, and all that type of thing. So uh, I suspect there'll be a, a, an additional component added every two to three weeks over the next two to three months. I can get additional information if council's interested in it or just accumulate what I have, I guess, but uh, it's, uh, it, oh. is, it is getting traction again, so. Over to council on there. 
anyone like to have, secure additional information on that? If you have information, it doesn't hurt to send it. That's for sure. Appreciate the updates. Yeah, I'd like to see it. Yeah. So please forward it on to all of council and, and of course, senior staff. Yeah. Thank you. Any other member of council? I'm going to keep it short because we do have closed session items. All I'm going to say is thank you to Councillor Neal for keeping it professional. We are head to head in fantasy hockey this week playoffs. <laughs> 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 and i'm glad as well that we didn't get into too much discussion on bylaws in the wards as my kids right now are being babysat by someone who lives in the wards so thank you for that so with that being said i will be looking for at 8 27 p.m that council move into closed session per local governance act section 68 1 j labor and employment matters including the negotiation of collective agreements a mover please Got Councillor Hurdle, seconded by Councillor Gumichel. All in favor of going to closed session, please signify by saying aye. aye. Thank you, everybody, for attending this evening. We'll be in closed session in just a moment once technology shuts down and the room clears out. Thanks again for being here. Chris, did I stay for that third <laughs> item? Or... Oh, my God. That's funny. <laughs> Thank you.